Dale DeGray. We will pay tribute to the head coach, Mark Reeds, and we will hear from the players themselves. But our first guest is none other than Fred Wolves, the voice of the Owen Sound Attack on Bear Radio. Fred, great to see you. Uh, do you still remember 2011 as vividly as I do? <laughs> it's, it's funny. I was thinking about this when we were setting it up. And Andy Brown has been quoted as saying that he remembers every minute of that day. And, and I'm not prepared to say that I remember every minute, but there are a lot of visages and, and sequences there that are, are still very fresh 10 years later, Manny. What emotions, what feelings do you remember having, Fred, or, and still have today? Because you were there when it all started in 1989 and uh, that first championship coming in 2011. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, when we made the call of the, of the winning goal, the, we said 22 years in the making, and, and different people have asked me, you know, was that uh, pre-rehearsed or were you ready with that? Ab absolutely not. That that was uh, an explosion, and that's what I remember. And, and even just talking to you now, Mandy, you get a chill in your arms and you a chill on your thighs and a chill on, on your cheeks when, when, you, when you think about that or when you watch it. And, and you're probably like me, that, that you've listened to the audio and you've watched that audio with, connected to the video a thousand thousand times and it never fails to evoke that kind of reaction you know within your body so in in terms of the emotion it, it is still very very real and very very vivid what was it about that team that made it so special and and Fred because you're so close to the team when did you realize that something special was brewing there <laughs> it's interesting. I know you're you're well connected with Matt Dumashell, and, and there was a game in Windsor in the Western Championship Series, uh, game number four of that series, and Owen Sound was leading uh, the series 2-1, and the game was tied going to the third period. And we did an out-of-town scoreboard with Steve Ritchie, and Steve said that St. Mike's was beating Niagara like 6-1, to one, and there was no way that Niagara was going to come back. And Matt and I looked at each other, and it was almost like the light bulbs going on over your head, and we thought... If we can knock out Windsor, we're going to the to the Ontario Hockey League Championship Series. And by virtue of, of the particular configurations that year, you're going to the Memorial Cup. So I think that was one, you know, one realization. The other one, you know, was was just a singular game where I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, Owen Sound was three points up on Kitchener for first in the division and in the Western Conference. And we went into Kitchener on a Friday night, real late in the season. Stephen Harper was in the building. I'm, I'm sure you remember that. There was a, you know, a real anticipation, and the game was great, and Owen Sound would, would score very late to make it a 3-2 game and win the game. So I think those two along the way that year stood out to me. Uh, those were two really good games too because i remember wa watching and listening to that game in windsor knowing what the score was happening i think that's a great point um let's go to that championship series then because owen sound actually lost the first two games uh and did did you the adversity that they never had what were your emotions there did you know that this team had it in them to come back no, I, I don't think so, Manny. Uh, you know, the second game was, I think, a Thursday night in Owen Sound, and St. Mike's won those first two games convincingly. You know, there were empty net goals, but still 5-2 and 6-2, I think, were the, were the final scores. And I remember the attack loading up that night after losing game two and heading back to, to Mississauga to stay overnight for game three on the Friday. And I remember watching them do that, thinking, well, you know, we're, we're going to the OHL or we're going to the Memorial Cup, but I don't know that, that we have a comeback here because St. Mike's had beaten Owen Sound twice in a space of a week in the regular season, and now convincingly had won games one and two, once at the Hershey Center and once at the Bayshore. And, and so, no, I, I didn't uh, have the sense right then and there. And even game three, you probably remember, it was 5-3 going to the third period for Owen Sound. And uh, St. Mike's would tie it on the on the shoulder goal by uh, Devontae smith Pelly, And you just had this sense of even on a night when things are going well for you, uh, the majors are are too formidable, and and they might get this. And then Matt Pat Grave scores that <laughs> overtime winner in Game Three from the blue line. Uh, what what the I game... remember about what I remember about that, Manny. Sorry to interrupt. Is just the hustle that Garrett Wilson showed to get back on side. Uh, it's you know Garrett got key goals against the Windsor team and and key goals in in this series with St. Mike's. But but that hustle play, I'm I'm not sure it turned the series around, but it certainly gave Owen Sound a lot of breath. Uh, and then game game four, tight checking, another overtime battle. 
Uh, game five doesn't go their way. Game six, a huge game at the Bayshore. And then game seven, which we, of course, we always remember. Uh, I remember you and I on the radio. Uh, we dubbed it Bayshore South before even the game began. Game one began, for that matter, encouraging fans to go down. And then, boy, did they ever show up in game seven. Uh, yeah, for- what do you remember from that game? Well, first of all, going back to, to game number four, one of my proudest moments on the PA in Owen Sound was when Cameron Bray scored in overtime to win game four in overtime. The place just went crazy, and I knew nobody could possibly hear me coming out of the speakers. And and by that point, the emotional level, the the the, the desire to stay neutral and, and professional probably had departed from me by, by that point. And I remember grabbing the microphone and yelling or looking at the St. Mike's bench and saying, uh, see you on Thursday. Because I, I think, you know, had St. Mike's won that game, that series might have been over in five. Had, had St. Mike's won that game, they might have won the series and, and Owen Sound would have been an, an entrant in the Memorial Cup rather than OHL champions. The other, the other point, too, when you're, when you're talking about Game 7 there, Manny, and the image that I have, you know, you and I went into the building at about 11 o'clock that morning. Uh, by, by noon, we had most of our prep and our interviews done and we're getting ready for a game that was two hours later. At 1 o'clock, the gates opened and they also fired up the video board in the Hershey Centre. And I just remember watching the stream of Owen Sound people coming in just one after the other. I know him, I know her, I know them. And and truthfully, during the course of the game, I spent a good portion of the game watching the video board because the, the in-house camera was just going from section to section. And you're going, oh, there's 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 Tom, there's Pete, there's Jennifer. And and the noise that they generated even in the warm-up for game seven was unbelievable. Um, I was pretty you nervous. Know- you probably sure. remember this too, but you know the doors open at one o'clock and people are streaming in, and and I don't remember who the players were that that came out from the attack to the bench to just tape their sticks, and there was a roar at that moment, and you just went, oh my gosh, is this going to be something this afternoon? Uh, Jesse Blacker was one of them. I vividly remember that, and you can see it. His face was going, wow, yeah. it was unbelievable. You know, I was walking around the building, and other people, hey, do you have extra tickets? <laughs> that we could, that one we of, could one of the great stories of all time. I was standing in the uh, in the lobby before Game Seven, and uh, Jerry Files' wife, and and I apologize, I, I've forgotten her name, but she grabbed me and said, "Do you have extra tickets?" Because <laughs> Jerry thought that he could buy them at the box office. <laughs> And I remember Jerry and I guess Lucas and, and uh, oh, I forgot the other boy's name, you know, Jacob and, and Mrs. File, they managed to get into the game and they were sitting probably four or five rows behind the St. Mike's Met Net. And Jerry told me later, he said, you know, I had to pay an awful lot for those tickets, but it's the best money I ever spent. <laughs> he was right there to watch that game winning goal. Is that the slowest moving puck ever <laughs> for a game winning goal? Well, it, and it was funny too, because you, your head just went in so many reactions or different directions when, when it finally got across the goal, a goal line, you're right. The next thing I did was try and look at all four officials to see if there was any way that they were going to wave this off. And by that point, you know, there was an explosion on the ice. So, you know, it, it was an explosion and a sequence of explosions all over that building. I had a emo- series of emotions explosions that I had to remember to shut up and let you talk on the radio <laughs> to, annou- to announce the goal. The well, um, yeah. It's funny too, Manny, about that. You know, the call is probably over the top, you know, but understandably so based on the excitement and what what transpired. But I think if people actually could see what was going on when we made that call, they would understand it because the crack security in the Hershey Center, for whatever reason, allowed three or four people to come into the press box and stand in behind you and I. And while we were trying to, you know, maintain some form of decorum, we were being shaken and punched and pushed by by these fans behind us who were naturally excited. But, you know, what in the world were they doing up there in the first place? (laughs) Yes. Um, The ride home, the parade afterwards. What do you remember from that? Well, the signing at Checkers Restaurant. (laughs) I signed an autograph and a a unique autograph signing. Um, I, I think... What what really stood out beyond that was the number of Owen Sound flags, you know, from from Mississauga through to Shelburne or Primrose, and then north of Shelburne. My first thought was, there's a fire at the liquor store in in Dundalk. You know, the fire trucks were out and the police sirens were there, and I'm not sure if you remember the sign or not. Uh, it it said "Get her done." But it looked like this family had knocked down their neighbor's barn and painted "Get Her Done" on, on this one, and it's they huge. stood on the side of the road. 
<laughs> so so the ride home was terrific and and also you know in that day and age uh texting and and whatnot were were in their relative infancy and and i do remember while i drove you spent most of the time uh, organizing a parade or making sure that uh, everybody could get down to the bay shore so it was a it was a fabulous ride home and, uh, and you know just like andy brown says just a, another minute in in what was a, a tremendous uh, a tremendous memory Fred Wallace, the voice of Bear Radio, here to kick things off on this special edition of Attack Rap. Fred, last question for you, because you've covered various sports in the scenic city around Grey Bruce. Where does this championship rank in sports history in Owen Sound and area? It's a good one. You know, uh, if you look at the major sports that take place in Owen Sound, uh, everybody has their place and everybody has their, their passions for it. So for me, I would say no question it's number one. But but for those that saw the Mercury's in, in 1950 or, or the Crescents in, in uh, pardon me, uh, saw the Crescents in, in 1951 and the Mercury's in 5051, that's probably bigger to them. And in fact, there are some people in Owen Sound today that, that talk as if the Mercury's uh, played 10 minutes ago. Um, I, I also would, would put in, in you know, my certain top five, the lacrosse championship of 2003. Owen Sound didn't win it. Kitchener actually won it here in Owen Sound, but the game and the tournament, that that uh, President's Cup was, was pretty terrific. So I'll, I'll rate it as number one, but with respect to, to all of the others that have taken place over the, you know, the history of the city. Yeah, maybe there's a recency bias there too, but there, sure, there yeah. are some tremendous tremendous highlights and sports history in the city of owen sound fred thanks for skating down memory lane with us here and uh, well, been, celebrating it, the championship it's been great fun manny thanks for the call we've got a lot more fun coming up on this special edition of attack wrap with some special guests uh the architect of this team and the players themselves stay tuned as you watch this special edition of attack wrap on rogers tv Thrill Nab to be joined by the president and part owner of the Owen Sound Attack, one of the original Super Six, as they call them, Bob Severs. Bob, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure, Manny. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, it's exciting. It is exciting. Um, did you ever think in your wildest dreams when you bought the team from the Holiday family, uh, that you would be celebrating an OHL championship in 2011. <laughs> well, you know what? We, we did believe that we would get there, but uh, when we first got the team, there was so much work to do, and um, the, there was uh, a long... We, we knew there was a long road ahead. Um, <clears throat> but I think there was a great plan put in place, and... Uh, and it, did come to fruition. It was quite wonderful. Do you remember that time when you bought the team? Oh yeah, very much so. Um, we've laughed about it a few times. I don't know if people know, but it was uh, the, the, there was some real anxiety around organizing the the financing. Of course, none of us are rich people, and um, and I remember the night before the sale went down, uh, my wife, who uh, is a very careful woman, uh, said to me, you know, if this doesn't happen, we're going to have to move. <laughs> so we were, we, we were very happy that it all worked out <laughs> because I quite like living here. So. Uh, so that would be the summer of 2000? If my yeah, memory serves me correct, April first. April first. Uh, I think maybe that's uh, significant. <laughs> <It's April laughs> <Thursday. laughs> but you know uh, the the way the community was seemed so disappointed that they couldn't save the team, and that the eleventh hour, you yourself and the other members of the Super Six um, came to the rescue. It uh, probably took you a little bit longer than you'd like to win that OHL championship, but yeah. <laughs> winning that championship, it all paid off. In the end, you sort of thought, wow, this is what it was worth, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. As I say, <clears throat> there was a plan um, that was put in place. Well, I wouldn't say in, in 2000, uh, I, I would say that in, in the, that first season, we were really treading water. We, we just had to get our feet underneath us and, and uh, figure out what we were doing. But then, then a, a, a plan was put in place 
that would we knew would take several years to um, to bring um, to fruition, and that involved um, increasing the uh, uh, the reputation of the organization and to to make it into a destination for young players and um uh, and and we knew that there was a long way to go with that and we weren't in any great rush we knew we knew that it was going to take a lot of building blocks but it was very gratifying that that all worked out and by the time uh, the 2010-11 season came along, we now were recognized as one of the uh, premier organizations in not only the OHL, but I think in the CHL, and were becoming a destination for young players. They, they were, it was a place where people wanted to come to play. That reputation exists today. How much did that winning that OHL championship help that reputation? Oh well, I, you know, I, I I do think it it was uh, very useful because you can tell people that you can get there from here, but when you actually do, um, then um, you know, seeing is believing, and um, so it did, it was very helpful. Let me take you back to the summer of two thousand and seven because you and your group had to hire a GM and had to hire a coach, and you hired. Dale DeGray, who in turn hired Mark Reeds. Talk about those two gentlemen. Well, um, uh, Dale, I, I think, has uh, demonstrated that he is um, one of the brightest minds in, in junior hockey, um, anywhere in the world, actually. Um, and he is hugely re respected uh, in the hockey world, um, as evidenced by the fact that when the league needs advice from a general manager, uh, they very, very often pick up the phone and call Dale, and he is on the competition committee, which is the central um, uh, committee for general managers in the Ontario Hockey League. Uh, so it, it was uh, fortuitous to be able to um, find him sort of at a point where he wanted to make a change from what he was doing and um and and to be able to land somebody who is so enormously connected in the hockey world and then for him to turn around and recognize that mark reeds was in a situation where um he was very successful in the minor pro uh, coaching game but was probably thinking that that he had got himself into maybe a little bit of a cul-de-sac and, uh, and and that moving to the Ontario Hockey League would be uh, remarkably good for his career. Um, so it, it was just one of those incredibly, uh, uh, incredible good luck stories. Um, and when Mark came, um, he brought a, a, a wonderful professional uh, attitude to the room and um, and the players absolutely loved him. He was uh, like everybody's big brother, you know, well, a remarkable guy, just a remarkable guy. And the media loved him too. Let me just <laughs> let me just put that out there. So, so, well, he was funny. Yes. <laughs> he, he could certainly keep you entertained. <laughs> yeah, that, wonderful. That is, <laughs> that is so true. So you hired them in 2007, and they came up with their plan. And it's it's the summer of 2010, and they bring in Terry Virtue as well. Um, but did you know in that summer, before the season even started, Bob, that you had an upcoming year that was going to be special? Or And if not in that summer, when did you realize that this was a special group? Uh, well, we knew that we had a great core and that Mark had done a lot of education with the young guys that he got in in 07, 08, uh, 08 09. Um, and he uh, taught them to play the way he wanted them to play. And we became a puck possession team, um, a high, high tempo team. Um, we 
uh, divested ourselves of players who couldn't play that style. And we brought in, um, as you're well aware, some um, key people who uh, I think uh, when we saw them in about mid-October, we recognized that uh, that uh, almost anything was possible here, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about Matt Petgrave, and of course Andrew Shaw. Um, these these people made a huge, huge difference in the way we approached the game, and um, uh, and I know Mark was very confident that something good could happen. Um, it's interesting though, that if you look back at the media comments, and I'm not talking about our media with you, because I think you've always had a really good picture of what's going on, but, but around the league, um, there was no confidence in our, uh, in our prospects for the 10-11 season at all. In fact, I remember reading something out of um, a, a, another place that will remain unnamed, uh, and they picked us to finish ninth. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, in, in the in the Western Conference, yeah. so so that would have been 18th overall. So anyway, um, but I think Mark was convinced that we were a bit better than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you finished yeah. first in the Western Conference, uh, in fact. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you ever did. <laughs> If that team ever did garner the respect that it did, did you, did that bother you, Bob, or did you like flying under the radar during the regular season? I love that, actually. Um, yeah, I, I I always want our guys to um, have something to prove, and I, I think a team plays well if they have a bit of swagger. So it's okay to think you're you're okay, uh, but it's not okay to think that you're terrific. And, uh, and, and I don't think you need, I don't think a hockey team needs to have anybody pumping its tires. Um, I think they need to look at themselves in the room and say, this is what we have and this is who we are and just get the job done. And, and I think Mark believed that very strongly. Um, he didn't want guys to get ahead of themselves. So it was fine that nobody had any confidence in us uh, we had confidence in ourselves. And you had a confident bunch, but you they they deserved to be confident. You had a Joey Hishon, you had a captain in Garrett Wilson, you had you mentioned Sean Peckgrave, you had Robbie McNardi, Jesse Blacker. Um the yeah. Jared Maidens was a rookie. Uh yeah. um, you had a three-headed monster in goal. <laughs> so um it was a a wonderful group. I mean, gosh, you know, like when you think about uh, front to back, um, Matt Stanish. Yeah. I'm trying to remember yeah. more names. Yeah, yeah, there was a it was a potent group, you know. But uh, other other than really Joe Hishin, no superstar. I mean, obviously Joey was was you know one of the class acts in the league, but um, at that moment, but uh, but there were no other mega stars and nobody you know nobody had any trouble getting their head through the door coming in and out of the dressing room it, they were they were very low-key and they were workmanlike and they got the job done uh and i think we snuck up on a lot of people <laughs> yeah you didn't have a player in the top 10 in scoring you didn't have a goalie in the top five in, in goalie categories, but here you were first in the Western Conference. You beat London in the first round in six games, swept Plymouth, yep. beat Windsor in the conference finals in five games, and then you faced a Mississauga team that was getting set to host the Memorial Cup. And you go down the first two games, you lose the first two games before you win game three and four in overtime. So, Bob, if let me take you back to the first part of that finals. You're down the first two games. What are you thinking? Um, I'm thinking that we played our game uh, in both those games, that we, uh, we weren't chased out of that rink, and, um, and, and that it was going to just take a little time for people to, to uh, recognize that that we you know that that we could play with these guys, um, and I think 
I'm not a firm believer in luck, but I but I but I do think that that we were a little snake bit in there, um, especially in the second game, and uh, that. But I, I still felt that that you know that it was well within reach, and uh, and we tried to impart that to the players to uh, to recognize that that they were they were really the class of the league and um, uh, and that it was still quite possible. You win games three and four. You win game six to force a game seven back at. Bayshore South in, in Mississauga. Um, the, the parade of people who went to Mississauga was unbelievable. That must have made you feel proud, though, didn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, like when you think about how far the franchise came um, in those 10 years, you know, from having a hard time drawing enough people to make a noise in the Bayshore to the point where you had. 3,500 people traveling to Mississauga to watch a hockey game, you know, it was uh, very gratifying. And, and, and I know the players were um, just astounded by that. And, uh, and they loved it. They said, I remember Joe Hishon telling me the, the remarkable feeling he got when he stepped on the ice in somebody else's rink and the noise was just overwhelming. Um, he said it was just, they were just playing a home game. It was just amazing, you know? And I remember Mark saying, uh, Mark uh, Reed saying um, how much that meant to him as well, you know? Uh, he, and I remember him saying to the boys, why not us? And uh, th that, uh, you know, that sort of said it all. It was Thank great. You. That came to fruition too. Where were you when Jared Maiden scored the goal in overtime? Well, I was just sitting in the crowd with everybody else. <laughs> and <laughs> could you see? Could you, did you have a good seat? Did you? Could you well, see? Yeah, I could see. I, I was sitting about uh, maybe twelve rows up, uh, just on the other side of the center line from um, from the uh, Mississauga goal. And I saw Jared go uh, right to left and stretch out. And I saw the puck go in. And I looked at my wife, Barb, and said, I think we just won. But <laughs> wait a minute. Because <laughs> she'll tell you I don't get too wound up about stuff. But anyway, I said, I think we just won. Uh, and then... The guys are all in the corner. I thought, well, I think that's what just happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, then, and then the parade that was organized oh. that night and the, the sea of people along Highway 10. I don't, I don't think you could have, have written a better script. No, I, I think it's, a, it's an iconic story in junior hockey for Canada, you know? I mean, not many people probably know that story, but maybe they ought to, because it talks about the importance of uh, this level of hockey in smaller um, markets and smaller venues across the country. And I'm sure the same thing would happen if the uh, uh, Prince Albert Raiders won the uh, won the championship, or um, or if uh, uh, Kelowna won the championship. You know, they, they these are not big big cities. They're they're mid sized places. But the hockey is so important to those communities, and it, and it it helps to define the community, and and uh, it gives them something to pull around. You know. And yeah, yeah, it was it was a wonderful experience to to see that and to see the reception that the kids got when they walked into the Bay Shore. I mean, again, they were astounded, absolutely astounded by that. And and I will be eternally grateful to the people of Gray and Bruce for doing that. You know. And I, I, on behalf of everybody in Gray Bruce, I think they're eternally grateful to you and the other owners 
who saved the team from moving out of Owen Sound. And I, I think you make a great point, Bob, in that junior hockey can tie together a community. And I think that was on full display in May of 2011. <laughs> it was, yeah, that was a... It was a, a really exciting moment here, and um, and I my uh, my bet is that we're going to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't bet against you. How about that? I, final question for Bob Severs, the president and part owner of the Owen Sound Attack. What will you remember most from that whole experience from that year? Um, I think it was the the a feeling um, amongst those players uh, and their love for uh, their coaching staff and Andy Brown. Um, that team was as close a group of human beings as you might ever find. And, uh, and they... Um, I stay in contact with some of those guys still, and I can tell you that they are still, many of them, the very best of friends. Um, their parents are the very best of friends. So it has, um, it, it's been a defining uh, thing in those guys' lives, you know, and it will go on for a long time. So that that's the best thing I remember about the whole business. You will hear the name of Mark Reed's aplenty in this show. And as it should be, Mark Reed's not only was a great human being, but a great coach that brought together a team that won that 2010-2011 OHL championship. And even though he's not with us today, we are glad to be joined by his wife, Mary Reeds, joins us on Attack Rap. Mary, thank you for doing this. Oh, yes. Pleasure to be here. I can't believe it's been 10 years already. Do you remember that championship run? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> it was a great ride. It was really fun. Very fun memories. Uh, uh, I want to take you back, actually, to 2007 when Mark was initially hired by the Owen Sound Attack, that summer of, I think it was July, 2007. Do you, what do you remember about that time and how much did uh, Dale DeGray have to convince Mark Reeds to take this job? And did you play any role in that? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think Dale had to do too much pushing. Um, he knew it was a great opportunity. Um, it was a family decision though, because it was a major move. And uh, there was a lot of moves with our family, but this was, you know, to another country. So uh, it was a little bit, it was, a, it was a, a little difficult for me to think, can we handle this? But I, I said, yes, go ahead. <laughs> we'll do it. So. So, so I guess I should say then how much convincing did Mark need to do to you to take the job? <laughs> uh, a little bit, but. I, I really wasn't that bad. I, 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 I usually kind of went with it, except once he wanted to go to Alaska and I said, I don't, I just don't want to do that. <laughs> um, uh, when I looked at Mark's career beforehand, and I remember this and having the conversations with him, he, he really never coached junior hockey players. Um, so how did, um, how did Mark sort of talk about that experience about, um, going from coaching older hockey players to coaching 16, 17, 18 year olds? Um, it was definitely a change. Um, you're more molding, molding their character. And, um, I remember, uh, just him having to like check with the teachers and, and counselors from school, make sure their grades were up, all that. It took a little bit of time for him to get used to that, but he, he jumped into the role, but you know, he'd say, Oh, so-and-so is not doing so well, you know, or, or th this person's doing great or, you know, but, um, he, he, he was like, well, I have a whole new set of family. I have all, all these boys they have to watch over. So, um, 
it was it was a it really was a great experience that's all i could say and he enjoyed uh, it i'm sure you were a sounding board for him uh during that time what do you remember about that championship season when you were around the rink when you were talking to mark when you went to games um what did i remember about it uh just the excitement in the air like the the whole town was just buzzing and um i guess because i'm from a bigger city so it, it's a smaller town and i just feel like the hockey is like everything and everyone just you could see it everywhere you went every, Every, at, at stores and um, at, at restaurants and um, not only at the rink, just every everywhere you'd go, there were signs up and people were like cheering everybody on and they mentioned something and go attack go and it was it was just um, just really precious. It uh, it's a little bit it's a a little bit uh, um, more quaint, I guess, when you're in a smaller town and just how excited everyone was. So real, that's I, I, what I remember um, uh, the most was just the people were so nice and just so genuine and just so welcoming. Mark, um, Mark seemed to really excel and really enjoy building that team up to that run as we talked about it. Um, he was hired in 2007, and it was a three, four-year plan to sort of build that team. Could you tell that he was getting really excited that that was going to be something special that year with, with the way Mark was talking about his hockey team with you? Uh, yes. Uh, I know it takes a few years to get the right mix and get everybody on board, um, uh, get the guys with character, um, uh, because he had won a championship before, he knew that there's something special you can feel when a team all gels and gets together because you don't win a championship if the team doesn't love each other. And really, um, they, they, they have to be able to step into roles. And, and maybe they don't want to do that role, but they're going to do it because they want that team to win. So he just knew he had the right mix. He, 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 could, he could feel it. Um, and I could feel it. So I've been been through a few things, you know, a few uh, runs with him, and you can you you really can tell a difference. And so uh, that's what I could say about that. He won the championship in Owen Sound, and then he went to Ottawa um, uh, soon afterwards. I think he was hired by the Senators in mm -hmm. that June of of 2011. Did Mark ever talk about afterwards his time in Owen Sound and what that meant to him? Oh, all the time, all the time. He'd say, "Oh, I really, I, I really miss Owen Sound." He, he, he really did. It was always the best memories for him, and just the best experience. And he liked, he liked being in charge. He liked, he liked putting all that together. He just, he was thrilled to do it, and he thrived on it. So, and he just, he really did love the the city. He, he he just had great friendships and just a lot of great memories there. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, we lost him way too soon in, in 2015. But do you think he re he realized, Mary, and, and do you realize how much of an impact he had on the lives of those young men that he led to a championship? I do. I do. Uh, yeah, some of the players, like, well, it's a little sad, but when he was... Uh, when he had passed away and even before he passed away um pe some of the players were visiting you know even the hospital or texting and sometimes i had his phone sometimes i you know i got to see the text or after he passed away the people were sending emails and texts and just i was overwhelmed with how much these players loved them and how much he had an effect on their lives and not just for hockey just as people and and a, a role model and so it was really inspiring and his whole family knew how much they loved him so it's something that you said earlier really rings true it was like his a second family another family that he had uh with that hockey team almost like i feel like he was almost like a father figure you know a second a second father role model um 
someone they could go to. And even late, you know, later on, players might um, even when he's with the senators, they shoot him an email or call him, you know, just to discuss something because they felt comfortable, you know, with him and they trusted his judgment. So uh, a lot of the fans got to know you, Mary, uh, during that uh, period in Owen Sound. Where are you now? Where are you living? How are you doing? How's the family? Uh, I'm living back in St. Louis. We've always had our home base here. That's what hockey people do. We have, we've had a house here and we were married for 30 years. So I'm back here and I went back to work. I'm a nurse. I do um, triage phone nursing. So um, I listen to people and help them all day on, on the phone. And uh, it's challenging, but it's really rewarding. And then um, my uh, daughter is a uh, we had our first grandchild and um that's been a really exciting i i wish mark could see our see charlotte our new grandchild but i'm sure he does up there and then my son is in philadelphia he's working for a pharmaceutical company so we kind of all have to touch base with each other and um but things are going pretty well so we have a pretty big family here i'm from a family of eight kids so there's there's a lot of family wow uh, congratulations on the grandchild. That's fantastic. Um, and, and thank you for your work in the healthcare field, especially during an unprecedented pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I know, I know we have all have great fond memories of, of Mark. Um, he had some great stories. Um, but I know he's left a lasting legacy on the players and I'm sure we'll hear more of those stories throughout this show. Mary, thank you for taking time out to talk to us tonight. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I, I just want to say hello to everyone. And um, it's really exciting to have this 10-year uh, uh, remembrance of, of that just wonderful win. It was so exciting. Thrilled to be joined by the general manager of the, that, that championship winning team. He's also still the general manager of the Owen Sound Attack. Dale DeGray joins us on this special edition of Attack Rap. Dale, how are you? Manny, listen, I'm I'm uh, st still doing what I've been doing, so that's fantastic. But I've been I've been great. How about yourself? I, I'm good. I have more gray hair. You look the same though. Can you Whoa. believe it's been ten years? You have gray hair. I have less hair. So <laughs> so that's I, I can't believe it's been ten years. It does not seem that that long ago, but. Um, Certainly, I'm. Listen, we all have great memories of of the event. So, um, it's. I think it's fantastic that we're doing this. I think it's great for Great Bruce County and and Owen Sound. Yeah, I think it's a great walk down memory lane here, and uh, it's great that you're able to join us too as well to talk about it. Uh, I still remember in July 2007, you were hired, and uh, one of your first jobs was to bring on Mark Reed. So. Uh, both of you were instrumental in that championship winning team. Um, everybody talks about that three year window when you're building something in the Ontario Hockey League and it, and it came to fruition three years later in that season, you won the title. So let me take you back all the way to 2007 when the cupboard was a little bit bare, Dale, oh, and you bit. built this was, team. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Bare, yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what was your thought process into building this championship contender? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I was coming from the Florida Panthers. I, I started the league for six years prior to that. But, um, you know, you, you, you're a hockey guy, right? You, you think, okay, it's a hockey job. Uh, there might be a learning curve. I mean, I figured there would be a learning curve. Just didn't know what to expect. Had no idea we had so few picks. And and turning things over would would be you know that sort of a chore. I had no, I really, I, I had no idea. And uh, you know there was some there were some deals made from the past that I had to I had to call up some general managers from the league and tell them that um, those things, some of those some of those trades, some of those things were they just weren't going to happen. And it wasn't easy calling somebody like Brian Kilray who who I've absolutely thought the world of ever since I played, you know, back in the late 80s. 
um, or the or sorry, the late seventies, early eighties, and but it was those were things they had to do, and uh, we went through it. And I remember we had an there was an owners meeting, my first owners meeting that I went to, and uh, of course, you know, Faye had, Faye had asked me, um, you know, how are we going to move forward? What what are we going to do? And you know, I told her that we had to move a couple of our, you know, obvious top players and uh boy oh boy she was she was a little bit beside herself thinking that i was going to be able to move or that i wanted to and felt i had to move these guys but but in order to move forward we really did and 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 we did and we picked up some picks because we needed them and and we went and we went on from there and and really just kept accumulating and picking up you know some good character players and it's something that we've always tried to do in owen sound and uh, and I think we've done a very good job of bringing in quality character type players. Did you have a three-year plan? Did you say Faye, the other owners, Bob, Brian? Did you say we're going to win in three years? No, that that th we did. There was no listen. <laughs> hey, Mark, Mark Reeds and I, we spent a lot of nights, uh, you know, out at Balmy Beach, and and we talked a lot about you know what we might be able to do because of some guys that we real some young kids that we really thought were going to be special players and but but the cost of moving forward is that you have to move out some guys that have been there for a while right um scott tragana wayne simmons right and those are really the two guys that when i said to Faye that we we're going to have to move out she, you know they were both players that she loved to come and watch but but they were going to bring us our our, our our best reward moving down the road. And we needed some picks and really it was the only way to move forward. And we felt that once we did that, we could maybe look at doing some other things. And, and as it turned out, um, you know, listen, Mark Reeds was the, was the biggest culprit for, for saying, Hey, let's get four years with this group. We will form this group into what we want. And then that fourth year, we'll have something. We will have something that people will take, take notice. And listen, I'll give I'll give him a ton of credit. I mean, you know, we would like I said, we would talk a lot at night, and uh, and he was he was bang on. He was bang on. We would we would work together. He'd let me know what he was looking for, and I'd go out and we'd try to find him. And that's basically what we tried to do. I'm I'm glad you bring up Mark because I don't think this team would have won without your work, but without Mark Reeds as well. See? Mark was integral part of it. What made him so special? Because he was really your first move. Right, he was your first move, uh, and and I'm sure you know. Listen, not living in Owen Sound, and and listen, I mean, and I know I took some some kick in the pants for not living in Owen Sound too. But <laughs> but the thing that people didn't realize right away was that Mark and I in the old in the old um, Colonial League, not the Colonial League, was United the Hockey League, in the old the United, United Hockey League, yeah. we were we. The owner of his team owned my team and owned another team as well. But but the other team, they got all the best players. Mark and I were given the same envelope of cash, the same amount, and we had to do what we could do with that envelope to the best of our abilities. I was lucky to be 500 coaching, and Mark was always in and around 700 in his coaching or more. And I, I always – now, listen, I played against Mark, and I knew the type of player he was, the feisty – you know, pain in the ass that he was. And so I, 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 I made the phone call. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about was in the old United Hockey League, he was in, four, he was in Kalamazoo. And I said to him that if he wants to move on, my, my approach to him was that if he came to the Owen Sound or if he stayed in Kalamazoo, the only way a general manager or the head of, the director of scouting in the NHL would watch one of his games would be as if their car broke down going through Kalamazoo to another city. <laughs> and, and he, he used to talk about that because I, I told him that. And then when he came to Owen Sound, he, he absolutely loved it. He loved it. And the biggest, the biggest thing that he had to get his head around was at the levels that he'd been coaching. And I always laugh when I, when we, we talk about this is that he used to think, well, where he was coming from, he had an unlimited amount of cards. Like, they didn't even have cards. And contracts he had were, were 24 hours. So you could bring Manny Pava in, 
and he could be absolutely no good and he would just turn around and get rid of him the next day and then bring somebody else in. So he thought we could do the same thing where we only have 30 cards. And then he, then he had a hard time understanding that if I bring a guy in, put him on a card, and then he goes out, that's still one card. If I bring another guy in to replace him, that's two cards. So at the end, I think at the end of our first year, I think we may have used the most I've ever used, 29 cards. <laughs> and that was because he wasn't so sure how it all worked out. And I was trying to appease him, but still had to make sure we had enough guys to get on the ice. He, but was he, he really was the, 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 the push for, for trying to do the right things right from the get-go. Um, you know, when you inherit a team from, from another uh, regime that, you know what, they were successful. They were successful. And, and, but it just wasn't what we were looking for. And Mark and I were both on the same page of what we wanted. We just had to get there. You brought in Terry Virtue in the summer of 2010. He's probably strutting around saying they brought me in and we won a championship. But what, what was the thinking about hiring Terry and adding him to the bench? Because I know he played an integral part as well. He, he really did. And when he came in, the big thing was, you know, it's junior hockey. We're a small market and we're trying to, you know, he was a local flavor, right? Um, so I thought win-win for us. You know, he had played. Um, I think he had coached a little bit assistant coaching in the East Coast League, and I thought, for us, that might be all we need to give Mark a second set of eyes, you know, another head for ideas. And, you know, Mark, Mark, listen, Mark will tell you, he's perfectly fine being on the bench all by himself, whether it was defensemen or forwards <laughs> and goalies. He, he had it all figured out. Um, so this was, a, this was a luxury for Mark to have another coach. And Terry did a great job. You know, Terry, Terry really sort of, you know, he, he became good friends with the kids right away. And so if Mark wanted to be hard on him, you know, Terry was there to, you know, to sort of massage the kids along to make sure that the message was still getting out and, uh, and we were all going in the right direction. Let's talk about some of the players on that team, of course. And um, you had a huge hand in, in picking a lot of those players. Um, Joey Hishin, though, he... Nope. he he was not one of them, right? He was no, he was. And hey, listen, we Joey and I still to this day we talk about. So obviously, Mike Fuda uh, before me drafted him, and then Mike left, and then I had to sign him. And you know, the thing was was that Joey's plan was he thought he was going to go to Kitchener, so I had to go and get him signed. And Joey to this day says his his mom never makes roast beef and i know i went to their place for dinner to meet with them and i know we had roast beef dinner <laughs> See, joey will watch this and laugh because we talk about it all the time he thinks i was in somebody else's house but anyways but so that's what i had to do i had to get him signed uh to bring him in i didn't know who joey hishin was i had no idea how talented he was i just saw this little cart driving you know uh, race car driving kid from a family that, you know, felt that felt that driving race cars was was less dangerous than playing hockey and walking across the street. So I thought I was going to have a tough go. But he, listen, it was we all know Joey Hishin. He is a diehard hockey kid at the rank. You give him an opportunity to be at the arena, be on the ice. He's not leaving. Yeah, he, and he stirred the drink for that team in the regular season. But I thought in the playoffs, too, he maybe didn't put up the goals. I think he had maybe five goals in the postseason. But he did everything else right, yeah, whether it's was... face-offs, PK, defensively. That series against London in the first round. Yeah. He, 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 he became that sort of guy that everybody wants to have, you know, the – the guy that when you're on the bench or you're coming off the ice and you see him and he is there ready to go, it's like, okay, let's, let's just get on the coattails because he's going, let's help him out. And it didn't matter what situation he was in, offense, defense, whatever. He was, he was, a, spe he was a special player. He really was. And, and, and really, right from the minute he put on an attack jersey, he was a special player, Manny. You could, you could see it in the stands. You could see it in the broadcast booth, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I know you could see that. Um, he was one of those special players on that special team. But 
Let's talk about the summer of 2010, because in that summer, did you know that your team was close? Uh, I, we, felt, we felt that we were going to have a good year the next year. And what we liked, and, it's, and I still like it when, when you, you know you've got something and all the media people that are OHL gurus call you and say, hey, yeah, how good are you going to be? Like, we've got you at six. Awesome. Keep us at six. You know, you fly under the radar. And, and we've done it. We've done it since the same thing where you, I believe we have a better team than a lot of people think. And it's nice to fly under the radar and then all of a sudden surprise everybody. So that was one of, that was one of those years. And I think Mark and I both felt we had something. Um, obviously we felt we had to add some pieces, which we did. Um, I asked that because you added some pieces in the summer. Uh, you traded Stephen Shipley, your first ever pick, yes, to St. Catharines for a player by the name of Andrew Shaw. Andrew, yeah, and Andrew Fritch. Yes, and and you know what? I can still remember watching video and uh, not not really wanting to do the trade, but felt that you know, ship was going to give us a, a real good return, like a real good return. And when I watched some video, actually, I'll be honest with you, the video of the guy that really stood out for me was Matt Petgrave. And, and there was a, there was a sort of a guy that quite honestly, how I approached it was, you know, would you, would you, I knew that they would move Andrew Shaw. I really, I, that was that was fine. I actually I shouldn't say that. He was he was a guy that they hemmed and hawed at first. Um, Fritch was a guy that they wanted to move. So I thought, okay, good skill. He's got this, but and I made some calls and I found out that Andrew Shaw was not playing as much as he wanted to, and that he was a pivotal part in that dressing room, and that their his teammates would be upset if he left. That Manny is a guy I want one of those glue guys in the dressing room. I watched some video. I was sold immediately on Shazen. But the guy is, the, the more video I watched, I watched this, this galloping stallion on the black end, on the, on the, he just going up and forth. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe this kid was, had so much energy. And I was like, I wonder if they would throw him in. I wonder if he's a piece that, that I could push to get. And, and I was so happy. Petter is one of, he's one of my all time favorite picks because of what he brought. I said French, it was Pat Grave too. And I, I, I need to correct myself on that. But you mentioned Shaw was a glue guy. He turned out to be a glue guy. Pat Grave scored the game winner in OT in game three to change that series against Mississauga in the OHL final. No, it, listen. They came, they laid it all on the line. They laid it all on the line. And I, I, I don't know. They were just those guys that, that you could put out in whatever situations and, and really contribute. And that's, that was what Mark and I talked about. Just bring some guys in that contrib can contribute, um, you know, shift in, shift out. And, and be blue guys with, with good energy. And you did that. Like, I, I look at some of the other names on that team. Garrett Wilson was not drafted by Owen Sound. Um, Garrett, I'll just stop you, Manny, but Garrett was a guy that um, the year before, I think it was the year before, I went out to, to watch a different player. And Ian McClellan and I went to watch somebody else in St. Thomas. And when we got back in the car, the only kid we could talk about was this number, I think he was number 15, and, and Garrett Wilson, and we were like, hmm, I wonder if we could ever get an opportunity to get this kid, right? And it just, it, as it worked out, you know, we, we certainly did. I, I, I don't know what we gave up for, for Garrett. Did we give up maybe a second round pick? No, it wasn't even that high. Uh, oh. So uh, you, you made that trade with Windsor. You yeah. made another trade with Windsor for Jesse Blacker. 
one of my all-time favorite. This kid came in, and he, boy, he became a man amongst boys at times. A lot of games. He's he's still a guy that he's still a guy that I would love to show the videos of of Jesse the way he defends. Um, he was just a a big, strong, you know, heavy stick, great shot, um, great feet. You know, Jesse Jesse just had to have somebody rein him in a, a bit to keep him uh, a little bit more anchored to to his own end because he felt that he could go and go and go and go. And you got to love his enthusiasm, but but he he was limited. But boy, he was a he was a heck of a player for us, and and a, and a great great asset. I'll continue with name association here because in that summer you also acquired Liam Healers. Awesome, like another one of my all time favorite. I can still hear him in the dressing room when I was sitting in the coach's room, just rallying the guys. He was just because where he sat, it just echoed down the hall. Um, still, still, still see him as a Peterborough Pete, um, on their website with, with the black thick rim glasses and his goofy grin and just thinking, you know what? He doesn't even look like a player, right? <laughs> but, but that year you have to remember. So being in Oshawa, I had season tickets for the Oshawa generals game. Okay. I got to see Liam play so much. And I thought to myself when I'm watching, there's an underutilized player. This kid would, could he could play on your first line, and he would check like a dog on the fourth line. And it didn't look like he complained, didn't look like he worried about anything. But let me put a jersey on and let me go show you how I can play. And just love that about him. Love that about him. The kid who won the playoff MVP award was another trade. Robbie, don't call me Bobby McNardy. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't think you're right. Because there's a guy, I, I, you know, because I would show up, I would be like, hey, are you Robbie? Are you Bobby? Like, it's funny you say that, because I would always be a little bit uncomfortable on how do, how do I refer to you as, right? But um, another guy that I used to see a lot, I see a lot coming into Oshawa, um, go to Belleville. Like, it just, he was, I always thought he was a great skater with really, really good skills and a phenomenal shot. And he reminded me of a guy I grew up with, Todd Huey, Garrett Huey's uh, dad. And that's that's what I, when I saw him, I was like, you put him with good players, he's going to take his game to another level. And he really did. I mean, I think, I think did you say that he was the MVP? He was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that was a bit surprising for me, but hey, kudos to him. That's fantastic. But I did think he would become a pretty good player for us. And he, another kid that just when he, when the move happened, he probably was a little bit nervous about it. Um, but once he got to Owen Sound and the atmosphere and his teammates, he loved it. Loved every second of it. Dale DeGray is our guest here on Attack Wrap, the general manager of the Owen Sound Attack, as we take a walk down memory lane and commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Owen Sound Attack's OHL championship in the 2010-2011 OHL season. We can talk about an, all the players, but Dale, I wanted to talk about what Mark Reed's referred to as the three-headed monster in goal. <laughs> not, not many teams have three goaltenders and use all three in the postseason, but you did with Jordan Bennington, Scott Stager, and Michael Zador. What was the reason, reasoning behind that? It was just injuries. It was just, that's all that it was. And, and listen, I would like to say that, that one of them didn't deserve to stay with us, but I can't, you know, and the thing was, was, you know what we, we knew we had to, obviously you have to keep your numbers at 25. You're limited to 25. Um, you know, when we traded for Michael Zador, um, we weren't sure what was going to happen. Right. But he came in and it was lights out. He was lights out. You know, you throw a young kid like Bennington in, he was lights out. And we knew what we had in, in Scotty. So it was almost like as long as the goalies could get along and the goalie coach could keep them getting along, then I thought to myself, wh wh why, why worry about this? L let's let them, you know, I told Mark, I said, this is going to make you a better coach anyways, because he's got to figure out who to play, right? So, um, 
No, all, all, three, all three goalies played in the OHL final. I don't think that's ever been done before. Prob- probably never. But we had, I think the whole team had faith in every one of them. It didn't really matter who we were going to put in. You know, and I'm, and I'm trying to remember if, if uh, Scotty had, did, did he have an injury? Was that one of the? He had an injury during the season. Okay. But everybody um, was healthy through the playoffs? Scotty played the first two in the finals, then then Zador, and then Bennington closed it. It was as yeah. it was as if you were the LA Dodgers putting out your <laughs> the pitching <laughs> your pitching rotation. Out. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It's uh, it, I I remember it, and and it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. It was I know it was odd, but they were their mindsets, their their character was was fantastic. I don't know if they were just young and goofy and didn't care like like I, I don't know but it, it worked for us um and it wasn't like it wasn't like the team was was gonna play harder or 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 weaker because of which goal you had in there i think they the, the group knew we were good they knew the goaltending was was going to be solid regardless and and we felt which was which was great i mean anytime like I said, I, i'm an ex-player anytime you start a game and you feel you can win that game, it's a fantastic feeling. And I think our group knew as long as as long as we put the jerseys on and went out as a group of 20, we had a chance to win. You guys were among the best in the regular season. And, and normally, typically teams who are going to go for it make a huge splash at the trade deadline. We didn't. Your huge <laughs> splash was acquiring Jay Gilbert. Jay Gilbert. <laughs> For a fourth rounder, I can't even uh, fourth or yeah, fifth I, rounder. I, can't I think remember. it was a fourth rounder. Yeah, and you know what's funny, Manny, is that I still have GMs that are are in the league now that were were in or around the league back then. They'll they'll call me and say, "Hey, I want to do what you did back in '11, <laughs> where where we had like one one piece." Because right now everybody spends their brains out, right? And they they change everything. Listen, Mark and I we talked we talked. I told you we talked a lot, and we felt we thought we had a great group of guys. And I mean, yeah, we put up we put up a lot of wins, and and we were exciting, and and we were a good team. But we had a great group of kids, and that was what we were sort of planning on moving forward with. Um, when I called about everything, I found out about Jay was that he was a bit. He was exactly what we needed, a big, steady defenseman. But I heard that he was he was like he was competitive, but he was fantastic in the dressing room. And he was a bit of a card where that he was a little bit on the funny side and and kept guys a little bit in stitches. Um, but I thought we had such a, a focused group that that would sort of almost be a welcome commodity. You know what I mean? When things get really, really pressurized. So, um, I mean, he was fantastic for us for the for what he played, the amount that he played for us um, as far as games go. But he was, he really was. He came in and, um, you know, he he showed us that he belonged in the lineup every single night. You talk about that close knit team. You finished the regular season first in the Western Conference. You did not have a top score in the top ten. None of your goalies were in the top five for save for goals against in the Ontario Hockey League, but yet you were first overall. You beat London in the first round in six games, swept Plymouth, beat Windsor in five games, including the clinching game, I think was 10-4 uh, at at the Bayshore. And then you face Mississauga, the hosts of the Memorial Cup, the team that finished first in the Eastern Conference, what do you remember from that postseason run? Seemed like London was the toughest hurdle to get over in that postseason, and then you face Mississauga, and you lose the first two games in the OHL. Final. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think I think first off, I got I, I got to tell you that's that's my approach to analytics right there. You just sort of summed it all up. That's what that's what that's what those all those analytics really truly mean, right? You got a good group of guys with a good team. They're just going to go and win, so it doesn't really matter. But, but no, I think I think our group realizes, and it's and it's often when I trade for a guy that that comes in from the east, I think they realize just 
you know, Cody Cece was a guy that I could tell you about. How he realized once he came to Owen Sound just how much of a different world it was back then coming from the east to the west, right? And, and I think we felt that if we could win the West, we got a great, great chance. And I mean, with Mississauga hosting, we we're going anyway. So what do, what do you really have to lose, right? And maybe, maybe that's what sort of changed the mindset after we, we, we won the West to go to the East and playing against uh, Mississauga maybe we kind of had a little bit of a letdown, like, well, we're going anyways. I, I don't remember that, but maybe that subconsciously was something that affected us in the start, but what a great series. What a great series that was. Yeah. Rogers is showing all seven games and games three and four were nail biters. One was uh six, five in overtime. The other one was two, one in overtime when the only yeah. goal scored in the, uh, the third in the overtime game, Cameron Brace scoring on a breakaway there. Were, what were your feelings? What were your nerves at the time after losing the first two games? Look, at, it's uh, just being an ex-player, I mean, I feel for the kids, but it's always, you know, you're, I'm not on the bench. I'm not on the ice. So my feeling is a little bit more reserved as far as I think we have a great team. I think we have a great coach. Um, and if, if we come up short, we come up short. But but I thought that especially once we won in overtime, first game, then it's you could you walk in the dressing room, you could get a sense like, guys, we're right here. Like, the hell with the rest of it. We are right there. Then we won the next game, and then it was like now we're going back to the Bay Shore. I think that's was it was it. No, we went down to the Bay Bay Shore. Shore. Yeah, yeah, we went down to this, and then it was like okay. Let's see how this all plays out, right? So you could sense it in the dressing room. I didn't feel it from, from up top, although, boy, was there some, some pressure cook in the, cooking in the stands with the fans, right? I still remember that going on, and, and everybody was like, okay, we're down two, but, you know, then you win, and it's like, now it's a whole different world. It's a whole different environment in the stands. It was exciting to be around it's funny you said that because I think one of the messages that Mark Reed's had in game seven was why not us, especially not? in, in that, uh, in the, at the end of the regulation and going into overtime, why not us? That was sort of the message, but heading into game seven, when basically half of Owen sound took over the Hershey center, three quarters uh, of the building was from Owen sound. I dubbed it Bayshore South um, did you feel confident going into game seven? Well, I know the pressure was on them. And I think anybody that's, that's around hockey knows. And, and that's what, that's what Mark and I, we talked about. If we can get to game seven, that puts an awful lot of pressure on the host team. Do you know what I mean? In their building. And let's just see how this plays out. If we're our be at our best, I think automatically I give us an advantage just because of the pressure factor um but i you know what when i when i look back and i think back and i and i see that banner or the the collage in the corner of the bay shore uh manny listen i don't i don't very seldom do i walk past that without stopping and and taking it in and 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 you know you reflect back on the players but you know you talk about bay shore south and the sign and seeing all of our fans, and it's it's I mean it's what that's what I that's what I sell young kids today on. I mean the experience in Owen Sound, um, the atmosphere in the building, and and the loyalty is just off the chart. But to go there and see that many people that early, you know, for warmups, and them really just steal the arena away from the Mississauga fans was unbelievable and obviously to have it all play out the way that it did was i mean that's why we're doing this it was it was really really special where were you when jared maiden scored and how high did you jump uh listen <laughs> i i was with uh brian denny and uh, ian mcclellan and we were in the far corner to from our bench 
off to the left, across the rink to the left, because I like to watch the bench if you can. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe because it was at the other end, right? And and I couldn't believe it went in. And I could not, because I like to be on, I like to be ice level when the kids come off the ice. So I I love to high five the kids. And and I just I couldn't run there fast enough. I just and then I'm trying to watch the video board to see the replay. Who scored it? How did it go in? And I, you know, I just I, I just remembered I was in the corner. And I remember being downstairs. How I got there, honestly, I don't really recall. But I, I knew that that's where I wanted to be. And just to see the excitement on the kids' faces because, listen, it was, it was really special. It was a special day. It was a special night. And to have a 16-year-old score, I mean, find me another time where a 16-year-old's on the ice in overtime getting that opportunity in Game 7 doesn't happen very often no wasn't wasn't that the slowest moving puck too <laughs> it really was when when i when i got to see it on the video it was like did it even go in did it, like, did it cross the line because i was like okay maybe it didn't maybe i have to go to a you know because players always get excited right it just has to get close to the line and they get excited so no it was uh yeah it was cool and to see that that jared did it was was remarkable you mentioned early on in the interview about the lack of respect for the Owen Sound team at the beginning of the season. I don't even know if you were getting respect in the playoffs either. Do you ever think you will gain that respect? I, th I think we've, we've sort of, you know, garnered it over the past. You know what I mean? I think, I think teams know that, um, you know, we're a hardworking, honest, you know, blue collar sort of team. I mean, we've been in the playoffs so many years in a row. Um, I think expectations are to not take us lightly now. Um, we seldom have teams come in and just kind of roll over. I mean, I know, uh, listen, coming into the Bayshore, it's not an easy drive up, no matter how you come into the Bayshore. And then to come into our building, and especially in the playoffs, when it's hot and it's loud and it's it's very intimidating for kids to, to come in and play against the attack. and We've talked about it for years about, you know, the importance of our fans in our building. I mean, listen, I, I, I have GMs and coaches and, and players that I talk to after the fact that they've left um, just say how intimidating it can be going into to Owen Sound. You know, you talk to NHL scouts, you want to see a kid that can he play or he can't play, go into Owen Sound on a Saturday night after he played a night in maybe Kitchener and let's see how he performs in Owen Sound against the attack. And and a lot of a lot of uh, NHL scouts use it as a mile marker for them. And it's a credit to the organization and what it's become. And it's a credit to the fan base that that wants us to be uh, competitive year in year out. Um, I know you've had a long storied hockey career. Where does this championship rank? Oh, it's you know what. Like I can tell you, I've I've been to at every level I've been to, Manny. It's it's I've been to the finals. I've been to the finals in the Stanley Cup with with Calgary, um, in the American League back to back years with Rochester, San Diego in the Turner Cup. Um, but this is this is something for me, you know. As far as that goes, I was a player with the Oshawa Generals, lost in the the final game in Portland. But this for me is something where I've always wanted to to do the, and I still do, try to do the right thing by the kids. And, and I always try to tell the kids, look, we will have a competitive team. We will, we will win games. We will have some success. And every year you don't know, you know, just how much success or where that success is going to take you. And listen, it's hard. I mean, this is a 10th year anniversary. I'd love every year to be there. It just can't happen, you know? And so to take this in and experience it with the group of kids that we did, being a being a dad, being a grown up, and experience and see it through their eyes again, oh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable to see just how excited they were and where their where their stories take them, whether it's hockey or 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 whatever field they got they've gotten into, they're gonna look back and go, holy shit, that was amazing. <laughs> We've heard from the ownership group. We're here from the GM, Dale DeGray. Now let's hear from the guys who 
won the title on the ice. A special Zoom call tonight with members of that 2011 Owen Sound Attack championship team. For many, the first time they've been together as a group in almost a decade. Guys, welcome back to Attack Rap. Can you believe it's been 10 years, Captain Garrett Wilson? No, I can't. Time flies, eh? When you're having a blast. Jeez, good to see all the boys. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, Joey Hishin, Scott Stager, glad to have you two guys on the call. Uh, as it looks like we're getting somebody else onto the call here, too, just in time. But Scott, Joey, you were the longest serving members of that Owen Sound attack team uh, that won it all in 2011. So uh, when you think back to that championship run, what did that mean for you guys? And to culminate, you started, was it 07, 08 was your first year? And then you won it all in uh, 2011. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, yeah, we were drafted in 07, eh, Hish? You were just a young young stud back then. Um, but yeah, it meant a lot to uh, see, the, see it go from, essentially, I think we had 13 rookies that year to winning a championship in 2011. It was, uh, it was pretty special. Sorry, we're going to have someone that interrupts me here. That's there okay. Look, who, who are we looking at? Who's that? that that's Steven. How face. old is Steven? He is turning four next month. Wow. That's great. And that's how's great. his hockey skills? His hockey skills is good. I just put up a big uh, screen protector on the garage there with a net and uh, some plexiglass. Wow. Please welcome into the box. Please welcome into the group chat, Andrew Shaw as well. Andrew, how you hey doing, Shazzy? Shazzy, pretty good. Well, chat just got a lot up there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a technical guy. I couldn't figure it out. Hey, glad to have you on. Also onto the program, Brendan Childerly, Liam Helis, Jared Maidens, Daniel Zweep, Greg Steger just left the call, uh, and Robbie, don't call me Bobby McNarty. What am I calling you? Is it Robbie or Bobby? What's going on? No, not Bobby. You just said, <laughs> that's my name. Don't call me that. <laughs> but Joey, chime in here for a bit, because you and Scott, you uh, 07, 08, uh, that first year, you 20 wins that year, uh, and four years later, you won the title. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, kind of crazy. Um, only 20 wins that first season. Uh, I can remember, like, to finish that season, too, we lost 20 in a row. To Mark Reeds was going for his um, – he was going for his 500th win with 20 games left in our season, and we couldn't get it done for him. So we, uh, we, we made up for it, obviously. Um, Mark obviously passed away now, but such an incredible human. I think uh, every single guy on this call would say – if not the best coach they ever had, one of the best coaches they ever had. So um, just an incredible guy that had stayed connected to so many of, uh, of us after we had won it. Um, and yeah, to be able to, to win with, with this group and Mark behind the bench, Terry Virtue, um, absolutely in, incredible. And, you know, like getting drafted with Scott and Helms isn't on here, but uh, getting drafted with Scott in 07, me and Scott played like a little spring hockey before the draft together. So we knew each other a little bit, um, but yeah, an incredible run. And um, like I said, I got to give all the credit or as much credit as I possibly can to, to Mark Reeds. Cause I think he was probably the, uh, the main reason we were able to pull together and, and win a championship. Uh, let's talk about Mark. that there guys. What's uh, Robbie, what's your memory of Mark Reeds? <laughs> My memory of Mark Reeds? Yeah. What do you remember about him? Uh, well, he, Mark was, he was a communicator. Like, he didn't have to bring the whip to get a team to, to play the right way. I don't know how he did it, um, but it, it could have just been his, his knowledge and depth of the game, um, the way he understood hockey players being one himself playing 400 plus games in the NHL. He just had that knowledge and was willing and happy to share it every single day. Um, for myself personally, you know, when I, when I came to Owen Sound, I was 
you know, heading in one direction with my career and, and Mark brought it back. So like his said, you know, I owe, I owe him about just about everything. And, you know, the fact that he's not here is, you know, it's, it, I, I, I think about Mark, you know, on occasion and it's just like, you know, what a, what a sad loss because he was just the, the perfect guy. So, um, but, uh, I'll remember the, uh, the goatee he had in the playoffs. <laughs> That was pretty good. Uh, Liam Hill is your coach now. What what do you do you take stuff away from what uh, Mark delivered in the room when you were as a player? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hish is a coach now too, and we got a bunch of guys playing. I think the philosophies that he embodied are ones that we all instill in our daily practices uh, now in our lives as as professionals in sport and in life and in business as well and. Uh, you know, the, the fond things I'll remember are his, his ability to add humor in times of adversity and uh, to everything. He made the game fun at all times. And I think that's an important piece that gets forgotten a lot by coaches. Um, whether it was him ripping out late to a practice with a sock on his head or uh, crowing like a rooster when somebody missed a pass, whether it was Cutter or Tedder or myself. And uh, I'll never forget sort of those, those little easy mem memories and uh, reminders too of the game where he wasn't really hard on you, but at the same time, he, he made it funny. And uh, he made it a, a great learning environment for all of us. Let me ask uh, you guys as a group, and you guys can, can talk about that. When did you know that that 2010, 2011 team was special? After the ever... first nine of 10 games, I thought, okay, something's going on here. I remember we, we lost the first game, but we all shot the team 50 to whatever. And uh, it was like, you know, we, sh we should have won that one. Then we won the next nine in a row. So it, it didn't take too long. <laughs> I would think like uh, once we traded for the certain players that we got, uh, the team just gelled together. It was just like a big family. Um, and my four years there, it was definitely – the closest team that we had for sure. Shazi, you got traded, traded yeah. there. What was, what, what's your recollection of first the trade and then joining the, this bunch? Uh, I remember hearing that we were supposed to be one of the worst teams in the league. So I wasn't happy when I got Shazi traded. Was pissed. Oh my God, oh. you're so pissed. Shazi called me. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked about that. It. I, I, I stopped on a few bridges on the way up there. <laughs> I was contemplating whether or not to jump, but uh, no, I just remember it was a bunch of misfits when I got there, a bunch of meatheads, if you may. Uh, but we, yeah, we gelled together. We all bought in. I mean, Mark was an incredible coach. I owe him a lot to my success as well. Uh, I don't know. He let us be us. He knew what, what we were good at and he, uh, he knew how to get that out of us. And I think just a bunch of small town misfits. I think just, we all, we run, we, we were all older too. So I think the veteran presence helped a lot as well. And, you know, some of the young skill guys we had coming in, it was, it was just a, it was a perfect mix of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think well, everyone held each other accountable. That's the way you got your girlfriend mix. One of any team. So. Uh, started with Mark, ran all the way through, and everyone kind of just held everyone accountable, and we were able to get off to a good start of the year, and we just didn't look back. Uh, Jared, you were a rookie on this team. Um, did, did these guys welcome you with open arms, or talk just talk about that experience? Because sounded like you were a pretty close knit team. First off, what's up, boys? Miss you, Mad Dog. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it was, uh, it was definitely an awesome experience coming in as a rookie and uh, just not knowing what you're walking into until you started seeing these guys, you know, in the room together on the ice. I mean, I had some pretty bad habits as a, a young guy, which I'm sure a lot of us do come out of minor hockey. So um, just Mark being on me, the other guys holding me accountable, the team in general, just taking under their wing was, uh, was pretty special. And it was an uh, amazing, amazing experience that I, you know, wouldn't trade anything for. So it was, uh, yeah, awesome year. Greg Stagger, would you say the same thing, or did these guys try to intimidate you? No, honestly, oh, no. Dude. <laughs> I was a little intimidated. Oh, like, uh, 
but yeah, like I think for me, like I didn't have the natural gifts hockey wise that Mates had. So um Amen. coming in, um, you know, everyone was hard on me and stuff, but it's <laughs> kind of it kind of taught me, you know, I don't know if I was like as dedicated as I should have. So kind of was a quick learning curve into what it takes to really be, you know, not only successful on the ice, but also off the ice too. And I think, you know, I think I attribute a lot of how I've done after hockey to that team because it was kind of the first time I've really been held accountable for stuff. Liam, when you got traded to this team, it was actually earlier than Shazi joined the team. Did you know that this was going to be a... Special team? Yeah, I think, as the guys mentioned, <clears throat> it took some time. And once we went on that winning streak, we kind of knew we had something special. Um, but I don't think anyone knew what they were in for coming into the season. That's for sure. Um, and uh, Shazi describes it best as a bunch of misfits, a bunch of kids looking for an opportunity that maybe didn't have it earlier or in other places, and we're very fortunate for them. It's kind of like the Vegas Knights. Like, and I think we kind of had that underdog mentality too. And we played teams that had firepower and were projected to be, you know, those teams or the big teams. Guelph was just down the highway and they had the likes of Latta Holland and Taylor Beck. And uh, I think that that's who we were big on taking the boots to. And, uh, and, and Windsor had, I think they were previous two time Mem Cup champions. I know you got that jersey behind your head and it's still I have no idea what you're talking about I have no idea what you're talking about and uh, <laughs> you know we we set our sights just we wanted to beat everyone Did so we were hit uh, flat on the bench though against Guelph they weren't a problem after that what happened <laughs> so we were fought glass <laughs> the bench that's the he kind of speared me when he was on the ice and I was on the bench and uh Kind of just stood up and we both dropped our gloves. And uh, I think Mark Reeds and I both got some game suspensions there. But I think I think Mark might have got more pokes in than you did on Latitude. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys were reading the clips, huh? The media, the so-called media that uh, had you meet, even missing the playoffs, and in some cases, Brendan, did you guys were you guys reading the media clippings? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily know the answer though, man. I don't, I don't remember ever reading it. I mean, we were, you know, some of the boys might've been more into it than, than I was as far as uh, the media and stuff. But um, I think as, as the boys touched on, we, we came together pretty quick as a group and obviously added the right pieces to, to uh, make the run that we did. And, and I don't think anyone even going into the playoffs really knew what we were in for. I and mean, playoffs are kind of a, a fresh birth all the time and anything can happen. And, obviously the right stuff happened for us. So it was, we were off to the right start and we, we knew what we could do. I just don't know if, if we knew kind of the full capacity of what we were getting into as a whole, but uh, like the boys are definitely a special group and, and uh, yeah, cheers to, to read on that one as well. Let's, let's talk about that, uh, that final series. Uh, I asked the question about Windsor because you lost the first two uh, against Mississauga. And what do you guys remember about those first two games? They still didn't give us a chance. No one did. No one believed in us. And we lost those first two at home, but sorry, on the road. But uh, I think after those two, I think we knew that we could play with them. At the time, even though we no didn't win. Knew it or what? I remember. Uh, you... Sorry, well, I just I just remember after those first two games, um, we went golfing. Believe it or not, I don't know if. if you remember this, but I'm pretty sure Heels, uh, Willie, you were there. I know Halmo was there and uh, maybe a couple other guys, but I, mean, I couldn't believe it that we were golfing. <laughs> but <laughs> these guys thought it was cool. So I was like, all right, I'll go. You know, if they're comfortable, you know, golfing when we're down 0-2, I'll, I'll join. Um, so if, you know, if, if other, if, you know, the, the people watching us were confident in our team, you know, we were, or at least we were willing to just take a second to think about, you know, like, yeah, here's where we are. We're in, we're in the final series. And I think I shot a 77 well. that day too. <laughs> yeah, I remember having McDonald's. <laughs> so, like, you know, we, we were we were right there. We were there. We were, it was a close, you know, it was a close series the whole way, obviously, you know, back and forth. And then we won those next two games. Um, 
and then you know just, you know start on the right direction. So um, yeah, that, that's you know something I wouldn't I'll never forget. Just, we're gonna go golfing today, and I think Mark found out about it too, and he wasn't pleased. But you know, what are you gonna do? Do boys remember? Yeah. Sorry to cut in. Do boys remember really that? Used to just... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, do you boys remember the prep for that series when? We didn't, they didn't expect us. I don't even think Owen Sound expected us to make it that far because they booked like a home and garden show at the rink or something. So we we loaded up a U-Haul van. All the boys were sitting in there with their gear on and went over to the, the old rink up the hill and we had to practice there. The boards are like falling over. That was our, that was our prep before game one of that series was, I don't even, I don't recall what the rink was called, but it was pretty humorous seeing seeing us get oh, together and then we we had something out in the parking lot too with the soccer ball at one point trying to run the power play and penalty kill i remember that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i think bigger <laughs> was all hot dogs too after practice <laughs> <laughs> so we'll blame the home and garden show for the slow start is that what we're saying so um was anything said though was anything said after the first two games it sounded like you guys were pretty loose Oh, I can I can remember Miggs mentioned it. Mark Mark found out, right? Mark found out about us going golfing. And I can remember him saying, listen, like if you guys want to pack it in and go golf and make your decision right now, or if you guys want to win a championship, we got to change some things here. And it was kind of like a wake up call to all of us. I don't think any of us put our golf clubs away, but it definitely woke <laughs> us up and it definitely turned around. Hey fellas, I gotta get going. I gotta help with the kids. Get them See off the bat. All right, Tone. I actually got to get going. going too, boys. I got to go to the game. See you, Shazzy. <laughs> nice job, buddy. Lucky, lucky hey, See you, Shazzy, boy. See you, See you, boys. See you, See you, boys. We'll get together soon here, eh? Yeah. yeah. You're matching, bud. Stop. Game six back at your rink in the Bay Shore. It was a must win. They had a 3-2 series lead. What do you guys remember about game six, if anything? I think I remember. Was Bracer score a couple goals that game? <laughs> Racer scored a um, uh, big goal in game four, too. The overtime winner, Hish with the nice feed uh, to the breakaway. Bracer had a big uh, game six. But did you guys feel pressure in that game six? I would say there was always pressure, but our fans were unreal throughout the playoff run, I would say. Um, like just going to the going to the rink and playing in front of them was just amazing. I thought like you almost feel like the fans are on top of you when you play there. Yeah, it must be nice every time you step on the ice they scream your last name, eh, Zweepy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of scares um, me a little bit. <laughs> uh, Greg, when did you guys uh, figure out that half of Owen Sound was traveling to Mississauga for Game Seven? <laughs> Um, I mean, the way back was crazy. And then it was basically a home game. Um, I remember like getting to the rink and kind of looking around and it was kind of like, there's a face I recognize, there's a face I recognize. And me and kind of Rose looked at each other being like, wow. Um, so yeah, really cool game to play. Like, you know, I was a spectator that game, but really cool game to watch. Uh, we couldn't believe it. There was so much family there too. So we sat with everyone's families and then, you know, coming back to Owen Sound was pretty mind boggling to say the least. Yeah. So game seven, you guys go out for warm up, and it's like a home game for warm up. They, they it's, are it's cheering like three, for you. Three guys. quarters of the fans were ours, I believe. I think right. I was, they, Mrs. Hoggett never had that many fans at a game. Yeah. <laughs> 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 He's right, 100%. Did um, did that atmosphere help when you guys came out for warm-up, when you guys are taping your sticks and you see half of Owen Sound in the building? Did did that help you guys at all? Migs, what do you remember about that? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can't really remember, but for sure it helped. I mean, and and also I'm, I'm sure it hurt Miss Saga too because, you know, here they are in their rank. And all of our fans showed up and, you know, they got three people supporting them and they're all Suzekas's family. So, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it just made it that much more special, but I want to go back to earlier in the series. Didn't Peck Grape score an overtime winning goal or something on a clapper game, game three, right? Yeah. Point. So, you know, sometimes it's just 
someone mm-hmm. as ridiculous pe- as Petter scoring an overtime winner that could just change the whole course of a series. Um, you know, obviously we, we had to earn every every inch we got, but um, you know, it's you know things like that. I don't think they they had Petter pegged as the guy that they had to look out for, and then he goes and scores that goal, and it's just like, well, you know, the, we're we're a team that just has you know so many different layers that you have to you have to be aware of. So, yeah, but yeah, going back to Game Seven yeah, for sure, um, and of course the, the drive home back that I'll never forget. The, the drive home back was absolutely incredible. I remember Willie and I think Whitey got to go in the little <laughs> car and the. <laughs> And I remember, I remember Binner complaining, like, "How come they get to go and none of us get to go out there?" And I was like, "Binner, don't worry, man. Your your time will come, okay? Just your time will come." It wasn't just one guy, you know. Robbie makes a great point. Like, you didn't have a goalie in the top five. You didn't have a goal score in the top ten in, in regular season scoring. There seemed to be always someone that stood up. Isn't that right, Garrett? Yeah, hundred uh... percent. That, that's that's why we won. We just, the whole the whole playoffs, I think different guys were scoring OT winners and scoring big goals for us throughout the whole stretch. Um, so when you have a new guy stepping up every night, uh, it's going to be hard to lose. So, um, yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that just kind of showed the depth of our team and uh, the work Digger did to, to build a team like we had. That rang true in game seven. Mike Helmo scored the first goal of the game. Uh, and then uh, a rookie by the name of Jared Maidens scored two goals, including what might be the biggest one in Owen Sound OHL history. Um, Jared, what do you remember from Game 7 yourself? I just remember the butterflies going to the, the game and just obviously never being in a situation like that and going that far. Um, but like you said, as soon as we got out there and saw all the fans, it was uh, pretty pretty amazing, pretty special, um, and a good opportunity. But yeah, the goal I remember is like the uh, the worst slash best goal I've ever <laughs> scored in my life, and I just happened to be at the right there at the right time. And uh, I mean, these guys led us there the whole year. I just happened to be in a <laughs> a lucky spot in front of the net, and I whacked at her like I was putting on the the putting green. So um, no, it was it was a pretty special special moment. And uh, these groups of guys led Clutch, us there. Buddy. Clutch. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you win the face off too back? I don't think they trusted me on the face off, Dot Manny. No, I don't know who who was it. I think was it heels. Oh, it's heels, wasn't it? You was guys? it heels? Yeah, yeah, I was. I think I was on the. I think I was in the face off circle there. Heels snapped there. So it was heels, or brace, that. heels, brace, and Jared out there. Um, yeah, you're I was right. On the that might for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> I was going to ask my about, but here what? I am on the bench. <laughs> we played the whole year together too. So I'm trying. Oh, yeah. to- I, 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 was Shazzy, I remember I was shit. Shazzy was uh, Shazzy was suspended game seven, so I think yeah. I was playing center in game seven. Oh, that's what it was. I was wondering who was playing in the middle. It was yeah. So that's, I think that's why the lines are all jumbled up. Yeah, and like <laughs> most of the year, we were all on all on our same or similar lines. I always moment. thought I was on the ice because I was the first guy in the pile. Somehow, <laughs> I, think I, got the, I think I got the maids first. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so let's talk about that. So Liam, you were on the ice. You won the face off back. I think it was uh to Shemich or um, cutting. I like oh, it was cutting. Oh, oh. I honestly oh, think it was man. cutting. I don't I don't know if I'm right. It could have been it could have been blacker too, but um yeah. And then Br- and then Bracer threw it out in front. And, and Jared, you whacked at the puck off, I think it was Riley Brace. And that might have been the slowest moving puck into that goal that I've ever seen uh, in my in my life. Um, uh, so let's go around the horn. So heels, where were you at the time? Do you remember where, where your view? Um, I, I remember seeing it go over the line, but my legitimate memory is like overhead. So I I guess it's it's a blur and. It was unbelievable. My gloves were shed and someone jumped on my back, uh, jumping into maid. So it was amazing. Just elation. Uh, Brendan Childerly, where were you? I was uh, parked right in the middle of the bench where I was supposed to be. Man. And, uh, <laughs> that was, uh, I, was, I was definitely on the bench, but uh, now I just, I remember watching, uh, watching it go in and not even really realizing it that it had gone in at the time and then, things erupted and 
by the time I figured out what was going on, Willie was halfway across the ice. So I was just playing a little catch up at that point. And, but uh, what a feeling for sure. So, so that's what I wanted to know. Did you guys know it was in right away? So obviously Willie did. I think I think I got made it to maids before the puck even hit the back of the net, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> I was I honestly tried. on the back check. Like I remember being out there being like, I gotta just play F three real high and wasn't really watching. And that, I think that's why I'm, I have no idea what Joey, where did you get a good look at it? I was uh I was uh in the same boat as Chile. I, I wasn't sure if it went in or not. <laughs> But I remember like the the building just erupting, and I actually I turned and gave the first guy I hugged was Mark. Um, I don't know why I did that. Like everyone was rushing on the ice, I was kind of a little bit late getting getting to the pile. But just I can just remember that being a a pretty special moment in my uh, in my hockey career. Like you you said earlier, me and him were we started in Owen Sound together. With Stage was the only guy left from that team. Um, Helms was drafted, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't part of the team. So it was pretty crazy to to experience that. But yeah, definitely de definitely didn't get out there as quick as uh, as Willie did. Willie definitely beat the puck to the back of the net. <laughs> the sweeper, did you get a good view of it? I I I don't remember having a view of it. Um, <clears throat> I was most definitely sitting beside Chili. We were probably having a conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I just remember like yeah, I remember seeing Willie go over first, and then just a bunch of us in the corner celebrating. But the fans were just incredible like it, they're just erupted like they said like it was and then we did like the whole skating around the rink and everything and it was just a, it was a cool feeling that you'll never ever forget greg i remember um you were with a bunch of guys um i think you couldn't you were down in the hallway right by the bench right yeah i was trying to remember who it was but it was me rose i can't remember if gaber dressed that game or not and then um I think Shazi uh, was with you too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we were waiting in the tunnel. I don't think we really had a good view, but obviously we came running out on our dress shoes and we we're kind of slipping and sliding all over the place. But um yeah, it was crazy. Robbie McNarty won the Wayne Gretzky trophy, 15 goals, nine assists, twenty-two games in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you touched turned to gold, or goals, I should say. What do you remember from that playoff run? Um, well, I guess I'll just first say when when Mad Dog scored that goal, um, I was on the bench and I looked at Halmo, and the first the first thought I had was, I can't believe it's over, because you know all the whole season. You know, all the ups and downs and obviously, you know, grueling playoffs. And it's just like, in a second, it's over. We won. So it almost took, you know, it took a few seconds. Like, I wasn't like Willie. Like, it took a second for, to process. Uh, but I remember me and Hommel jumping over and just going crazy after that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't remember what, I, I mean, even going back to minor hockey, I always loved playoff hockey. And then... And my OHL career, other than my first year, where I only played two games and I was a rookie, so I wasn't playing a lot, I was just dying for playoff hockey. Um, so when I finally got the opportunity in my fifth year, um, you know, I wanted to make the most of it. And, you know, sometimes it just it goes your way. So, you know, that, that playoff run, it was, it, was going, it was going our way, it was going my way, I was scoring lots of goals. And, um, you know, the, the, more, the more you score, the better you feel and the better you play. So it was just it was one of those things. Um, I also found that, you know, I, I enjoy playing teams over and over again because I like to, you know, observe the way they play and I get to know the other player and I get to know what he's good at. And I just remember, um, as long as goalie, I had his number in, that, in, the, in the final series. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's personal matchups. You can get in other players' heads and they can get in yours depending on the game. So that parade afterwards, people started lining up on Highway 10. I think you guys were talking about it earlier. Like it was in forty-five Dundalk. Like Dundalk. Dundalk, forty-five yeah. minutes to an hour yeah. away. People yeah. were lining the highways. Had you ever seen that before? What do you guys remember from that? When did you know that they were planning a parade as soon as you got into Owen Sound that night? I don't think we really uh knew. Like 
we saw everyone come coming up the highway back and then when we kind of got out of town a bit we stopped because we heard they were setting something up or something and that's kind of when we uh got the first taste of it there myself and black or like you said we we got the the ride in the convertible that led the bus and it was the coolest ride in the town i've ever been on it was awesome the support the whole town showed it was it was incredible and then just getting to the Harry Lumley and that that being packed was even even cooler. So no, it was awesome. Uh, memory I'll always remember. I remember some guy pulled in front of the bus and just joined, decided to join the parade. It was just having the greatest night of his life. <laughs> uh, Chili, what do you remember from that parade or the party after? And I was, uh, it was pretty incredible. Like these boys said, I, we didn't really know what was going on. And I do remember, uh, like Willie said, we pulled over and, um, I remember hearing, uh, the fire trucks and then seeing them. And then all of a sudden it was just traffic, traffic and got more and more dense as we were going into town. And, uh, just, uh, as these boys said, an incredible ride in and so much, uh, fan support. And then obviously getting back into the rink and, and having that place just, jam to the gills and Shazi coming sliding out with no shirt on. So it was, uh, it was pretty incredible and, and definitely, uh, definitely memories of a lifetime, but uh, just uh, to, to be able to do that with these guys and, and this group and uh, it was very special all around. Jared, were you the mayor of Owen Sound for a whole week or what was going on there? I think, I think Jared was uh, the guy who scored the OT winner. He was the mayor. Uh, I was just lucky enough. I was the old guy. I got to go on the convertible, so I kind of lucked out. Blacker kind of weaseled his way in. Might have took uh, Hish kind of yeah, yeah. he, he's there the longest. I kind of thought that maybe he should be in the convertible. I kind of felt a little <laughs> guilty too, but... Uh, Benner was I mean, pissed about it. Benner was, <laughs> was furious. I don't blame him, man. There could have been a lot of guys in that convertible. We should have just stuffed it full of guys. <laughs> it, was, it was actually kind of crazy. I mean, made scored that goal, and we still couldn't get a girl to talk to him for weeks after that. So it's, it's kind of, I, I don't, I didn't know how to help him at that point, right? So glad you're getting um, on. We're almost wrapping up, but um, how yeah. you been? And uh, we're celebrating ten years. Can you believe it's been ten years? No, that's special. Um, when I saw the the email the other day, um, you know, I actually, we always kind of said that hopefully we'd have a 10 year anniversary uh, and kind of keep that going. Cause it's such a, obviously such a special time and, and uh, memory for us. And, you know, maybe this summer sometime or next year we can get together, but um, it's something that we'll always have with us and we're, we're forever champions. Right. So uh, Owen sound will always mean something to us. I'm going to open up the floor to the guys because the guys have been having a lot of fun. Uh, not at your expense, but maybe you've come into the chat a few times here. Um, but I'll let you reconnect with the boys and, and turn my mic off. Um, what? Let me just ask you, Jordan, what do you remember about Game 7? Uh, I was... Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I had to do too much work in Game 7, actually. I think Game 6 was more of a bigger game for me and the boys kind of took over in game seven I remember specifically in overtime uh I think I can remember each goal against actually on me but I remember in overtime I think I just had to make one save and then we went down the other end and uh obviously the goal um bracer to maids and uh, the boys just celebrating yeah it's kind of that's kind of the gist of it but um you know, just seeing how happy everyone was. And uh, I don't think I realized how big of a deal it was uh, at the time. I was, I was younger. And, um, but it's a, it's a special moment, even family-wise, you know, the, the parents involved. And, um, yeah, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Could you, could you get a good look of Maids' goal going in? Oh, yeah. I think good... I had a, might have the best seat, arguably. Arguably best seed in the house, I would say. Maid said, Maid said you bailed him out, though, in game seven. Did you, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't remember. Uh, how, do, you, do you remember not getting a ride in the parade afterwards? How mad were you that you didn't get into the convertible afterwards? I was. I remember that. Because it wasn't blacker in it. Yeah, yeah me, and, me and Black yeah. got in there. We should have stuffed that thing full of guys, man. True. Well, can you have more than one convertible? 
<laughs> Holy smokes. Throwing rackets and stuff. Not we oh, were man. throwing. It was just one, <laughs> one of us was throwing. Yeah, well, it's not really fair if I don't have a weapon versus you, Weeper. Uh, I had I had no option. I couldn't hit you back. You played all the time, and I barely did. So I was like, ah, I can't do this. Uh, wow, that's funny. I haven't thought about that for a while. I, I I actually do remember that story. We were we were in like the uh, equipment room, and our teacher, Mr. Carr, comes over. He goes, "What are you two doing in here?" And Ben is throwing rackets at me. <laughs> oh man, that's yeah, how I don't know what you guys. Say. That's how tight you guys were. You could, you could fight in the dressing room, throw rackets at each other, but then you were brothers uh, on the ice too. Yeah, we'd always oh, yeah. make up. No, it was fine. Yeah. Benner, what was it? Oh, we were there. We were. We were there I was going to ask you. Together, I believe. Yeah. 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 Ben, I was going to ask you, what was it like having a three-headed monster? Because we we had talked earlier about all three goalies playing in a seven-game championship series. I don't think that's ever been done. Yeah. Did Zades make the call? Yep. <laughs> we did. I couldn't hear him. Z Zades did um, not, but but Scotty was on. I remember, you know, I just thought of a story when we were in the room. I don't know if it was said already. I apologize if it was, but we were in the room and people just started making noises. Do you, do you guys remember that? Yeah, we haven't talked yeah. about it yet. Go ahead. <laughs> no, everyone's making noises like Heels is doing something crazy. Um boys are banging on the their stalls and uh i remember just specifically zades <laughs> zades was just doing a steady whistle just one noise and and uh it was pretty funny but we were, yeah, all, we were we were all making a noise and then we all stopped and we we're like zades what what noise what were you doing and he just goes <laughs> <laughs> yeah he was contributing that was funny uh, it was just a, a wild group and Shawzi was crazy. I roomed with Shawzi on the road, and that guy, he wouldn't even nap. So when we were playing throughout the playoffs, we wouldn't even nap. And then he'd wake me up because he knew when my alarm was. So he'd wake me up with a pillow over my head, and we'd just go at it for like 10 minutes. And we'd tornado the room, and then we'd just pack up and leave. <laughs> but I'm blaming him for that. <laughs> Sure, he dumped off the call. I, I guess uh, before we end things, uh, Captain Garrett Wilson, what do you remember about that year? What do you remember about that team leading this quote unquote group of misfits? Yeah, just uh, how close you were, like everyone said. Uh, we we're we we're a group of brothers and we had the same same goal in mind and we were able to accomplish it. And uh the thing I remember most about Owen Sound is probably the the fan support, the town getting behind us, and uh, I think a big thing was the uh, attack pack there, Helen Lewis and Brian and Brian, all of them, what they did for us, making sure that I remember they'd give us money, they'd fundraise, so we'd have snacks on the bus, stuff like that, and they're just unsung heroes that didn't get enough credit, and they really uh, helped us along the way, uh, supporting us, and uh, just uh, yeah, just just how close we were. Uh, obviously, Mark reads uh, how great he was for us and, and how much he taught me and how, how much I learned from him um, and how close we were winning. I'll just always I'll remember, uh, like Benner said, it's, it's uh, got a place in our hearts. Wow. 